You know, it's like a speaker's worst nightmare. Don't, for those of you who haven't yet given a talk, but who want to, don't, don't assume that will ever happen to you. You will never have trouble with me. <laughs> I promise you. All right. Um, oh, there was something else I was going to say. Oh, I usually have time to set this for however many minutes until it buzzes in my hand to remind me to shut up. And I got distracted and didn't do that, so you're just stuck <laughs> until I'm done. Um, okay. So, I hate to be the one that has to bring this to your attention, but I fear that you are not entirely happy. And, and I believe that some of your unhappiness is an outgrowth of dealing with other people. <laughs> and I know this for two reasons, okay? One is that, you know, for 35 years of my life, I had a day job where I went to my desk and wrote code, and then I wrote that book, and it was like a bomb went off. And then now, now when I get paid, it's because I'm teaching. I'm teaching courses someplace, and so uh, 10 or 12 times a year, I go to a brand new shop and spend three days with the people. And so, I'm, uh, unlike, like I used to just know about the kind of unhappiness I had at my shop, and now I see unhappiness everywhere. So, <laughs> so there's that, right? Like I get out and see unhappiness. Um, the other reason I believe that you're unhappy is because there's, of course, a study of that on the distribution and causes of programmer unhappiness. And so here's what these, these folks did. They went and harvested half a million emails from GitHub, and of those they randomly picked about 33,000, and they sent them all mail asking if they participated. Uh, 1,300 and some people answered, and they corresponded with them to identify ways in which programmers might be unhappy. And they ended up, I kid you not, coming up with 219 different ways in which a programmer could be unhappy. And so they sent a survey back to all the people who had agreed to respond, and in the end, they had, they had, the unhappiness codes were referenced 2,280 times. Um, an average of 10 or so references per code. But of course, the unhappiness is not distributed evenly. Right? So now I give you the top 10 reasons <laughs> why programmers are unhappy. So you can see these, this is uh, 817, this is like a third of the total references. Um, so you could be stuck, I don't know, that seems kind of fun to me, but uh, you could feel time pressure, bad code quality, you see, you can walk on down the list. Underperforming colleague, I'd really enjoy, like I wonder if they sent the survey of two people in the same shop, or they <laughs> some extra floor firing squad. All right, and, and you notice also that for every one of the reasons, that every one of the ways in which you could be unhappy, they categorize them as internal or external. And while I agree that internal uh, causes of unhappiness matter, they are not the topic of this talk. And then this number six, I don't know, I think of a mundane or repetitive task as just an excuse to write a script. And so, so I'm going to throw that away too. Because I got, I got this, and now it works because of his dongle. <laughs> All right. And so, if you look at this list of six, you can see what the problem is, right? It's other people. <laughs> they can be so annoying. Like, like you probably can look at this list and figure out. You probably know how to solve every one of these issues, and yet other people keep misbehaving in ways that causes pain to roll downhill to you. If only they were the way you want them to be, <laughs> and everything would be great. And so, if despite your best efforts, you have not been able to get others to see the error of their ways, this is clearly a problem of persuasion. Now, and now's the time for me to confess that I actually have a degree in psychology, and that this is something from which one never recovers. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, shaped, it has really shaped how I understand the world, right? When I see people who are unhappy because they can't come to an agreement, I see failures of persuasion. And this, it makes me sad. It's like we're, it, this should not be a problem. Human beings are hardwired to be persuaded. It's, it's an evolutionary thing, right? We, early humans are weak and soft in a world that was hard and cold, and the humans that did better at collaborating were the ones that lived to reproduce. This is evolution in action. Right? We are wired, we, we, we evolved to collaborate with one another. And so there's a ton of research about the ways in which we are persuadable. And I'm going to take you um, 
I'm going to look at a couple of perspectives. Right? I'm going to teach you two different main ideas about the ways in which people can be persuaded. Here's one. This guy's name is Robert Cialdini. He's a psychology professor at Stanford and UC Santa, Santa Cruz, I think, yeah, and Arizona State. He wrote this book. Some of you might be familiar with it. It has sold three million copies. I have a book. It's never going to sell three million copies. <laughs> so what he, did, what he did in this book is he, he, did, he looked at all the research about persuadability, and he uh, tried to get a synthesis of it. So he basically distilled out of all the ways in which humans are persuadable six different rules. So I'm going to walk you through these six rules. The first rule is about reciprocity. It's, and the rule says that if I give you something or help you in any way, that you're obligated to reciprocate. It's a little bit more sophisticated than that because it also says if you offer to help me, if you offer a favor to me, I am obligated to take it. And it also allows, um, if, if I, uh, it allows you to ask for something in return. If I ask you for a favor and you do it, then you can ask me for a favor back, but you're allowed to ask me for a bigger favor than the one I did for you. All right? And you can see how we might have evolved this rule. It means that in the cold, dark world, you can give away fire or food, whatever you have, even if it's scarce, and with the knowledge that someone's going to give it back later. Right? You can share in advance, and it'll get reciprocated later. And you can see how that would be evolutionarily adaptive. Uh, the rule is so, it, it basically saddles you with a future obligation. And it's so powerful, we're so hardwired, that it can easily be exploited. Does it, are you any old enough to recognize? What are these people? They're Hare Krishnas. All right? It used to be, uh, if you, well, there was a time in America when every airport in the land had people dressed like this in it, and what the, here's what they were doing. They had a uh, scheme, a fundraising scheme, and it worked like this. They would give you a flower, and then they would ask you for money. All right? Nobody wanted the flower. And nobody wanted to donate, but it was really hard to, to, to reject the flower. They were offering it to you as a gift. And once you had taken the gift, it was really hard not to give them money. All right? Now, like I said, nobody wanted the flowers. Like, if you, like we spent the 80s skulking around in airports trying to avoid running into the Christians. Right? People who, who were there are nodding their heads. And, and, it, and it was also true that like, if you got stuck and you took a flower, you gave them money. People just throw the flower away around the next corner. And the Christians, of course, knew this. There was always something like on flower trash with tree <laughs> Like they were just going to get the flowers and recycle them. Back. And th there was a huge uproar about this for a while in the United States because people were really mad about the exploitation of this rule. It seemed really unfair. Uh, so much so that in 1992, the Port Authority of New York City start, uh, opened a case against them that went all the way to the Supreme Court where they won. Right? It was a First Amendment issue about whether people were going to be allowed to ask for donations in public spaces, and the Christians are lost, which is why you don't see it. And, 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 you know, all, for all the fights that we have today about the First Amendment, like free speech is a very big deal in the U.S., yet these people got denied the ability to do that because we were so mad about this rule being exploited. All right, rule number two, uh, consistency. We want we have a really strong uh, internal need to appear consistent with things we've said or done in the past. Um, if you get someone, so here's the thing about this, right? You've heard that thing that says you can't legislate morality. Well, it turns out you absolutely can. Like if you, there are a bunch of, there's a bunch of research out there where if you force people to behave in certain ways, it will change their attitude about those things. But what, what happens is you act your way, action comes before thinking. So you can act your way into a new way of thinking. So if you can get people to do something, you can make them more, like, you, like taking a point of view that you don't uh, agree with and being forced to hold, uphold that point of view in a, a mock debate will change your attitudes about that idea, whatever it is. Um, this rule, just like reciprocity, you can see it would, it would be super useful to have people be consistent. Then you could rely on them to reciprocate later. And you can also see it's so hard work, you can tell it would be super easy to exploit this rule. For example, you know that thing, parents in here know that, you know that thing where the holidays are coming and Christmas is coming and there's some cool new toy and there's ads all over the Saturday morning cartoons and the kid says, please buy me Toy X and he promises that you'll buy them Toy X and then you go to the store and there's no, they're nowhere to be found. Right? There's a reason for that. What happens is the toy companies make most of their profits around the holidays and what they would like to do is spread out their sales cycle. 
right? The way you do that is they can use, they can uh, exploit this rule against parents. They advertise those toys and they're not, they don't really intend to sell them. So what happens is you buy your kids something else for Christmas, you give it to them, and then the ads reappear in January. And your kid says, hey, give me that thing. And you say, I haven't gotten Christmas. And the kid says, of course, but you promised. Right? That's your buying your kids gifts in January. <laughs> Social proof. If I don't know what to do, I'll take my key from you. Right? If you fire alarm off right now, we all look at each other, and if someone got up, we would leave. Right? That's the thing. It's like you assume if someone's taking action that they know more than you do. Um, if people are doing it, I should do it. If they're refraining from doing it, I should refrain from doing it. Um, I use this rule all the time, personally. I'm a psychist, and it is common on the long ride to find yourself uh, without facilities. And so if you, if you leave your bike by the road and walk off into the woods and you have and your, your colorfully dressed group of cyclist friends is standing there, like all you have to do is walk off in the woods and on a road where there has not been a car in hours, people will start driving by. <laughs> right? And we, we don't want to, you know, we don't want to offend anybody. And so I, I have learned that I can absolutely control, I can completely control the gauge of passersby. All I have to do is get all my friends that are standing by the road when a car comes, is all you just get your friends to all stare fixedly in the opposite direction. That's all you have to do. And you can watch a cat and the cars drive up, all the heads turn to where the cyclists are, and then they all turn and look over. It's social proof, right? Those cues are super important. There might be something going on that you should pay attention to. Uh, the fourth rule is about authority. We're going to believe people. We, will be, we agree to be persuaded by people who have authority. Now, uh, there's a couple of different kinds of authority. One is this obeying me kind of authority. The people in uniforms often have it. But there's also a kind of authority called expert authority, which we use a lot. Right? In our, uh, we believe that some people are experts, and we like, I learned TDD this way. Believe me, I, I was terrible at it. I thought I was a good programmer, and people who seem smarter than me said we should be doing TDD, and I started trying to do test for development, and my productivity dropped to zero overnight. <laughs> right? But I persisted because it felt like, like there was nothing in my lived experience that made it seem like a good idea. I just believed the authorities. I thought if I just did it enough that they probably knew more than me, you know, I'd get better at it and they would tell All right, number five. There's two more. Five. Five is about liking. Right, so here's the rule. If people like you, they are more likely to be persuaded. Now, I know you're saying, <laughs> But it's, from a, from a psychological point of view, it's extremely, this is a super powerful phenomenon, and it's so deeply embedded in our biology that you can't hardly even think about it. Right? Like, amoeba don't have best friends. Right? And so, what is the purpose? Like, we, we, you, the question I would ask is, what is the evolutionary purpose of liking? Like, why would you like somebody anyway? And it turns out that we like people that we know. We like people that we've had positive interactions with. It's linked, unsurprisingly, to trust, which is linked all back to reciprocity. Um, we help those we like because we think that help us with be reciprocated. And it, again, it's very, liking, liking is sort of down in the bottom of your hind brain, right? Um, you probably are more aware of that. You, you know that feeling you have? Someone's being overly friendly and you're having that, I don't even know where to just get a friend's feeling, right? Or when you see somebody in the grocery store at a distance and, and you, don't, you don't really, like you don't like them enough to want to see them, and so you're doing that sort of hiding behind the house. <laughs> like liking is super powerful. Like, it, it's a, well, liking, liking deserves your attention, right? Because it is very powerful. And this is why salespeople act super friendly, because they're trying to tip into that liking thing and uh, get you to, to get them to get you to do them favors. And right? the final one is about scarcity. We one way to persuade someone that they want something is to imply that it's you know there's not much of it. This is why Amazon says you know seven left. That's why. Um, you're afraid, we're afraid, perceived scarcity increases the meaning. We're afraid we're going to miss out. And one of the things about scarcity, scarcity adds value to super surprising things. Like, for instance, you know that feeling you have when you're waiting on someone to back out of a parking place that they're taking an especially long time? Think about what's going on, right? You're right, first of all. I can take that. You're right. 
right? If you ask the people in the cars who are lean in the parking place, if you ask them to, tell, to say how long they took, they say about the, about the normal amount of time. If you time them, they all take longer if you're waiting, right? And it's because of the fact that you're waiting adds value to a scarce resource, right? You can make them, you can't make them go faster, but you can make them slow down even more, and that's by, you guessed it, blowing your horn. <laughs> right? uh, that signal is a signal that the spot is super valuable. All right, so here you go. See you um, So now I give you a little book report, an, 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 an opinionated book report, but now, now I can tell you that I hated this book. <laughs> Absolutely hate it. See, Levy refers to these six things as weapons. Yeah, weapons of influence. Okay, let me just read some direct quotes from him. He's talking about these six things. Their strength is in the nearly mechanical process by which the power within these weapons can be activated, and the consequent exploitability of this power by anyone who knows how to trigger them. Here's another one. The great advantage is not only that they work, but also that they are virtually undetectable. Right? He's trying to sell you things. And he's trying to use the, what I think of as some of the best parts of human nature against you. And it just made me mad the whole time. There's a, there's a little bit in this book where he pays a little service bill. I'm just teaching you to defend yourself with that really is. He's trying to teach people how to exploit these qualities of human beings so that you can get them to spend money on things they don't need. All right, so I read that. Because that's, that's the biggest thing. If you go looking for persuasion, that's what you'll find. There's another uh, perspective on persuasion that I had known about for years, but I had never read. It was a book written by this guy. Do you know who this is? From the days of black and white? Yeah, it's still Carnegie, right? He wrote How to Be Friends and Influence People. Has anybody read it? It's worth a Okay, look, hands. You probably forgot it, though, right? So you should be happy if I tell you that. Okay. <laughs> Um, it's classic, right? Um, the, the central idea of this book is it's built around the, the notion that it's possible to change how other people behave by changing yourself. That's a simple premise. It, 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 he has four different categories, and each category has like some bullet points at the end of the chapter. And I'm just going to run the bullet points by so you get a sense of what's in there, and I'll, we'll talk about it maybe chat a little bit as it go. So this first section is about how to make people like you. It's got six principles in it. Some of these things, okay, I can do that. I mean, this is super, these are really important to people. I would rather talk frankly, but at least, I can, at least we can talk in terms of their interests. Sincerity is a big deal to him, right? You can't just pretend. We're not selling something, we have to, it has to matter, all right? Here's a second category. He calls it handling people. It's more like getting along. It's sort of 1920s language, right? Uh, here, there's only four things in this category. Don't criticize. Again, sincere appreciation. Make him want it. Oh, did I? Was that? Sorry, here we go. Yeah, okay. There's only three. All right. Sorry, these are all time. Now, now that I hit the button on this, we have to wait. Uh, okay. Third category. This is, this is the longest one. It has 12 things in it. So, right? How to get people to agree with you. Don't argue. Show respect. Oh, this is so hard. <laughs> that I can sort of do. Get him to agree with you right away. Don't take that credit well. Don't do all the talking. Don't try to take any credit. Assume you're right. right. That's another assume you're right. Grammatize your ideas. Okay, I can do that. <laughs> All right, and finally, here's the last one. It's about, it's about leadership. There's nine things in this category. Now, as you watch this list, I want you, if you have a boss, I want you to imagine what it would feel like if your boss behaved this way. And if you are a boss, I want, I, I want you to think about how it would change your shop if you did these things. soul searching on it. It's very definitely, it is not about them. From Carnegie's point of view, it's all about them. 
right. So then we have, uh, well, there's a list. That's the, the four things. I the, it's a little bit, you know, it's that 1930s and I mean, it's, it's a little dated. Two or three now. It'll wake you up a little bit about it. Look, I, I have every exam in my behavior. All right. All right. So probably you've forgotten 19 minutes later, but remember where I'm happy is because of those other people. <laughs> And if we can only persuade them to behave correctly, everything will be better. All right, so uh, Sudini, you can read Sudini, you can use those techniques if you want. Go press the buttons, use those rules, or you could maybe consider uh, using Reed McCarney stuff, buying that. Um, that. That book has been around since its 80th. It, you know, it, it's, it's had many, many, many editions because it actually does so it's, it's totally worth doing that. Um, but now, now comes the time, now we have the time to talk, and we have to wonder, we have to ask a question about the problem in having those other people. And it's this. How do you know that you're right? I mean, maybe it's true that it would be better if you got persuaded. Maybe you shouldn't be getting your way. If you're wrong, like there's so many things in software that we don't have good ways to measure. And then all these arguments fall down into just opinions, and people fight about them in the loudest voice wins. Right? Maybe it's maybe we'd be better off if we needed to. Maybe we'd be better off if we didn't have small. Right? How do we know that you're right? I mean, mostly you don't. You have a feeling about how to write code. It's possible that if you won, it would make things worse. Now and very often, so there's these fights. Like when I go out and see this in happiness, what I see is fight after fight after fight. And mostly what people are fighting about, but they have the same idea about what the right end is, and they're actually arguing about means. You know, they're having knockdown, drag out fights fight about the stop line. And so in, in, in these conflicts, so when you, when you get into these big conflicts with other people, one of two things is true. Right? Either they are evil, and they actually do want to destroy your software. <laughs> or they just have a different opinion about how to get things done. And we, it's, it's possible that we are much more alike than we are different, but you would never know it by looking at the unhappiness that I see in some shops that I go to and that I system is true in some of your shops. I think that we all, all of us, share a common set of moral goals. And this is not only because I believe in your good intentions, though I do, but it's also because I see what's true deep in your heart. I know what motivates you. And in times of conflict, if you understood other people's motivations, you would be better equipped to forge agreements. Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we care about the things that we care about? How can you motivate people to do work? This, of course, leads us to Daniel Pink and his book, Draw. Right? He, uh, this is some research from MIT. This guy did a bunch of experiments where he had people do tasks, like putting widgets together and shooting balls and hoops and stuff like that. And he incentivized performance with money. So he would pay people a little bit of money for kind of crappy performance and a medium kind of money for a medium and then a lot of money for the best performance. It's kind of like work is supposed to be. And here's what he found. As long as the task involved purely mechanical things, money worked as work. But as soon as there was any component of cognition involved in the task, Money was not only a good motivator, but it was actually counterproductive. Right? And this is not one of those social science experiments that can't be replicated. You know, they're having a big replication crisis right now. This is an experiment that's been replicated over and over and over again. Money helps from tasks that don't require thinking. But if you have a task that requires thought, money gets in the way. Now, let me be clear. It's not that money's not important, it is, but you just have to pay people enough. Right? People have to be paid fairly so that money gets taken off the table. Once you pay people enough, it's other things that determine how well they do. Right? And Daniel Pink identified three things that he calls drives, or dri the drives that, make, the drives that motivate us to do work. And the first one is the drive for autonomy. We want to be self-directed. This is why children learn enough to go up and leave home. Right? You're super motivated. I, I want to control my own life. The second drive is for mastery. We want to get better at stuff. And the third drive is for purpose. We desire work that matters. This, for those of you who, don't, who haven't done this, this guy's on a cold morning on a roof in Dallas, Texas at a Habitat for Humanity voice. 
He's built us own house. We crave control over our lives, and we yearn to get better at things, and we hunger for work that has meaning. These are the things that motivate us, and when you think of it, they perfectly explain open source software. We all share these as common driving motives. And so if we agree that we have these motivations in common, then conflicts between us due to differences are, are really due to differences in strategy about how best to meet goals. So if we want the same ends, but we just chose different means, it may be that the real insufficiency is one of understanding. And instead, of, it's possible that instead of trying to persuade other people to do things our way, that instead what we should do is get better at collaboration. Get better both at influencing other people and being influenced ourselves. And so that leads me to teamwork. There's a bunch of studies on this. Groups innovate faster. They see mistakes more quickly. People in the groups are happier. They get better, they report higher job satisfaction, and they get work done. But teams, of course, involve people, and we've decided that people are the cause of, most of our, much of our unhappiness. But persuading, I continue that persuading them to do things our way might not cure it. So instead of asking, how can we be more persuasive, it's possible that we should be asking, what can we do to make better teams? And Google asks this question. They have a lot of teams, they really care, they've got a bunch of people. It would really help if they knew what, what if they could uh, spin up teams that they knew were going to be high performing. And so they, they embarked on a thing they called Project Aristotle to try to figure out what made good teams. Um, they got data and they're good at it. So they, they looked at everything about all their teams nine days from Sunday. Like they knew which teams were high performing and they knew who was on every team. And the first thing they did was they went through and they looked at all the qualities of all the people to try to figure out what it was about the individuals that made good teams. And all they could find was that nothing that they could find mattered. <laughs> so here's what they figured out. Like they figured out they got a bunch of names. Like the, the skills and the backgrounds of the people on the teams don't matter. It doesn't matter whether they're all introverts or extroverts. It doesn't matter whether they have similar backgrounds. It doesn't matter whether they have similar education. It doesn't really even matter whether they get them and whether they go out and socialize. That whole thing about whether you're a good fit for the culture doesn't matter about making high performing teams, right? right? Um, it just doesn't. Um, so as they, as they were struggling with this, they came across some research from other people about this idea of group norms. So a norm is just a rule that we all agree on together that can control the behavior of the group, and it's really different than a thing that an individual can do. And so they started looking at that. And they, and they still were having trouble figuring out what it might be. And then they ran across a little bit more other research from people at Carnegie Mellon and MIT, some a different thing where they were looking at uh, these another, this other group of researchers had taken the idea of individual IQ, and they were wondering if a group could have an IQ. Right? And so once they started looking at uh, the idea that a whole group might have might evolve some qualities that were about the group and not about any of the individuals. They finally figured out how to predict which teams were high performing. They identified the single quality that teams have. If you know that a team has this quality, you know that it's going to be high performing. This is what this is what they all have in common. It's about the fundamental quality that distinguishes high performing teams from others is how the team, how teammates treat one another. That's all there is to it. And they, they noticed specifically two behaviors about this. Uh, the first one is <clears throat> how much people talk on the teams. Of course, since they were doing research, they called it equality and distribution of conversational term <laughs> 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 But really, it's just a matter of how much. So, actually, I have a couple of quotes, so I'll just read it. Um, on some teams, everyone spoke during each task, on others, leadership shifted among teammates from assignment to assignment. But in each case, by the end of the day, everyone speaks, everyone had spoken about the same amount. As long as everyone gets a chance to talk, the team does well. But if only one person or a small group speaks all the time, collective, collective intelligence declines. Right? So the first one is how much you let people talk. The second one is this thing they call social sensitivity. I was interested in uh, Gabby's talk from uh, right in this slot before here. This is just a fancy way of saying that they're skilled at figuring out how other people feel based on their body language. Right? You care enough to study other people so that you can look at their expressions or nonverbal cues and figure out what they're feeling. And so it's a, it, uh, it's a signal that you care that you think other people's feelings actually matter. 
And so within psychology, these two things, conversation in terms of have a shared belief that their team is safer in a personal risk taking. It's, it's, it's when you have a sense that you're, you have confidence that your team won't embarrass or reject or punish you for speaking up. It's, uh, it describes a climate where there's trust and mutual respect and people are comfortable being themselves. Now, this isn't the only one that's important. Like, we have to have a, a culture of having critical goals and a culture of having deadlines that you want to meet. But Google's data indicates that psychological safety is the most critical element in making teams successful. It's the thing that makes teams work. And making your team safe starts with you. You can set the tone of the next conversation you have. In these conversations, words matter. Words about the past are often about blame, and they're best avoided. Words about the future are about corrective action, they're about improving what comes next, and you should strive to talk in that way. Uh, when faced with a conflict, it's okay to have strong opinions, but they should be weakly held. Have an identity, but keep it small. Don't bind yourself in the straitjacket of consistency that whatever it was that you thought was right in the past. If you think back on Carnegie's suggestions, they're all so open-hearted and forward-looking. They're the kinds of things that would make teams safe, but somehow we aren't always able to do them. What prevents us from sincerely trying to make them like us, from winning them over, from being a leader? Why do we fail to trust their intentions, believe in their motivations, and make a safe place? Consider this. If during a heated discussion with someone at work, the person you were talking to accused you of being purple, what would you say? You'd be like, uh, tell me more about that. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have a strong reaction because you're not secretly afraid that you're purple. <laughs> you're not your code, you're not your past, you're not your parents, and you're not responsible for everything. I, if you pop the why can't you get along stack all the way down, what's there in the bottom of the well is fear. And I know this because I'm afraid. And I suspect that you are too. But I also know something else. Fear, that fear is just the background noise of the human condition. You can't avoid it. It's going to be there forever. You, can, you can't escape it, but it doesn't have to define you. We all have it, but along, alongside it, it's also true that you are good enough. I feel the need to repeat that. I stand here and I look at you and I can see that you are good enough. Hear me. Put that word in there. Your past need not dictate your future. All right. It is true that there are some situations so toxic that your job is to leave. I'm not asking you to stay there. Right? But it's also true that if the problem is miscommunication rather than pathology, the most efficient way to change everybody's future is by taking a deep breath and changing yourself. If you want to achieve your purpose, learn the tools of persuasion and then use those newfound powers to make your team more psychologically safe. We're hardwired to work together, and a good team is always better and more fun than a single individual. To build the best team, you need to go out and find a way to be your best self.
I, you know, I wrote a book about an uh, object named John that uses Ruby as a language, and I wrote a Oh, you know what? Wait, did I not put the slides? I did not. The, the 99 Bob's Ruby book is coming out in JavaScript. And God, on the second edition, it'll be ready. I'm not going to say that about the very soon. <laughs> Once again, a round of applause for Sandy Knight.